You know, uh, during our visit here this afternoon to uh, Europe's smallest national park, I um, am reminded of an English teacher, you know, a teacher of English literature that I had when I was back in college in Montreal in Canada. And um, she was a specialist in uh, Elizabethan literature. And I think that was the 1500s uh, in England, uh, 1500s or 1600s. And one day I asked her uh, why she became a specialist in that period. And she said, well, the first thing that appealed to her about it when she, was that she loved reading so much, but she got so frustrated by how much there was to read of, of modern literature. And so uh, she thought to herself that she would pick a, an era that um, where it was possible to actually read everything that had been written during that period in your lifetime. And she had done that. She had read all of the literature available in English during that century. I guess that's the time of Shakespeare, right? I'm just showing here how rusty my uh, memory and knowledge is of all of my training in English literature. But that's what happens through the years. Yeah, since the park is so small, they have really great trails. There's not a lot to worry about or look after and, you know, of course, very well maintained. And as they say, it's one of southern Sweden's most natural um, deciduous forests. So um, there's a lot to look at, even though it's so small, it's very concentrated. It must be very beautiful in a couple of months, even, you know, beautiful in a different way with all of the spring flowers that will be emerging here, just carpeting the forest, forest floor. You can see that here everywhere. Yeah, in their interpretation signs here, they really emphasize the, the microtopes, you know, um, the way you have microclimates and micro ecosystems. And here they're very uh, quick to point out how the, um, uh, the stream here creates different vegetation and different uh, fauna, you know, insects and so on, d that depend on it. And there we have Helen over there on the old bridge and then the new bridge and so on. And other folks going by there. It's interesting when it's winter like this because you have to do a lot of interpretation, you know, when all the leaves are are gone. And for example, here's another whole rain and avalanche of tiny green apples carpeting the forest floor there amidst all the brush. Just think the way this is going to look in the spring and summer. That's the thing about deciduous forests. They can be so... Oh, um, full of one's uh, s destiny and so on, you know, the, the spooky feelings, especially as twilight comes around, you know, and it all looks so barren and sad. But w at the same time, you can just think it's resting, you know, winter is resting and it's on its way, saving its ba batteries, you know, the forest is charging up, resting, saving its ba batteries for the coming spring and there's going to be an explosion of color and greenery and we'll be walking in a tunnel here as we um, explore this little micro national park Europe's smallest what is what a distinction it's quite amazing Really fascinating what the insects have done here. They've basically just hollowed out these trees with their work, you know, and that's the other thing about it being a, na a national park is that, as we found in Canada, you can also over-preserve, you know, like you prevent forest fires and you mitigate anything that otherwise, you know, 
if left untouched by man, by humans, would be, um, you know, um, destroyed and wrecked and ravaged and then have to renew on its own. But you see an awful lot of, you know, these huge old trees that obviously um, haven't managed to uh, withstand the storms and then they block the trails and have to get sawed away, you know, all the windfall. <laughs> Food for the birds, energy hanging in the sky. A real dazzle of brilliance here, just hanging up in the air. It's lovely. Whoops, oi oi. There we have some trail signs, obviously. There you go. And then we'll take this direction for now, I guess. That trail there, uh, this one that's called Rock of Egan, it's the straight path. And we'll take the crooked path over this way. There goes Helene there. There's a, there's one of these, I think really attractive little maps of the whole park. And you know, we started um, over here and then we've gone all the way around now and I've been showing you little clips from there and we're at this point. And where it said Rock of Egan was there and you see it's straight right across there. And here we are. And I mean, we've been out here maybe a half hour and we've gone more than halfway around the perimeter of the National Park and seen quite a few people, a lot of people walking their dogs and stuff. But it's quite fascinating how there's so much crammed into such a tiny little place. And, uh, but of course, it's in a context. And out there, we found out that the National, National Park is connected to um, nature reserves. They've surrounded with nature reserves that, that connect in a chain of nature reserves across the Swedish countryside and that there's trails going all the way uh, between them and so we're putting together a little network in our minds of where we're going to hike next time and how we can go from there to here and you know how it is. And here's another one of these transversal uh, trails going right across. We'll go there later. Wow, we're definitely going to come back here in about a month when that whole slope is just going to be covered with 
different shades of blue and white and yellow and it's going to be just beautiful in a whole other way and of course it's has its beauty today too that's another story Let's see what we've got over here. Never been here before, so I've got to check it out. That's the thing about exploring, even on the micro level. It's such fun. You don't know what they're going to be pointing out here. Let's see. Ah, it's a bird watching station. Ah, it's apparently a well known place for one, two, three, four, four different kinds of. Uh, nut hatches and uh oh no woodpeckers they're all woodpeckers so there you go the black woodpecker the great spotted woodpecker the uh lesser spotted there that's the lesser spotted woodpecker and then the uh green woodpecker and then the great spotted woodpecker and the black woodpecker and then some explanations of course of their anatomy and what they eat and stuff and then over here a bunch of other birds the stock dove nuthatch tree creeper starlings chaffinch or chaffinch willow warbler and uh, yeah various about birdsong in general and there you go. And apparently it's a real oasis just because of the diversity and the fecundity of the place. Uh, and so the birds uh, gather here. And it's quite a charming little place. Of course, I imagine another day when we, now we know about this and we'll have a little lunch with us and a thermos. And today I've just got water. So anyway, back we go. Yeah, and so we're getting to the back to the end here of our little circumnavigation around the the uh, perimeter of the entire national park uh, this afternoon i think we've been out so far about maximum an hour you know it would have gone a lot faster but we've been stopping so much to look at everything and enjoy everything and all the detail that's there and that has been pointed out to us as well and there's a very you know a very beautiful little ecosystemic think thinking uh, at work here. And so uh, there we are across the Scanian plain towards the Baltic Sea and um, the Östersund, the strait across to Copenhagen off to the right. And here we come in to the uh, sort of trail center and the, uh, um, the interpretive signs and stuff over here. A lot of people out with their dogs and their kids and so on. It's fun. It's nice. Here we go. And then uh, there. And I'm just going to go stand here by the little sign and uh, finish off our little tour today. And there it says, welcome. Oh, you can read it yourself. Well, you know, welcome to the smallest national park in Europe. Enjoy spring flowers and birdsong in one of Skona's most natural forests. I wonder if they changed this with the seasons. Obviously not, but, well, lots of flowers in springtime anyway. But uh, it's so cool. Yeah, it's right, yeah. Yeah. Right there, you see the woodpecker up there. Maybe it'll treat us again with its pecking. We got a nice little drilling sound a moment ago. Oh, there we go. It had enough, I guess. Yeah, the sun is on its way down, and we're in the last few hundred meters of our afternoon walk. And just at the end of the of the trail here, in the straight way, Rock of Egan, we came into a little depression here in the valley. And uh, we looked around a little bit because it was so pretty. And there was you can see an old, old bridge over there, one of the original hiking bridges. And they just leave it there, you know, to, 
to uh, decompose. And anyway, way over there, um, just under the trees, let's see if I can zoom in here. Um, you can see uh, there that there were stones set blocking and that there's a kind of dike over there. So of course one starts to think, well, this would have naturally been a uh, pool, you know, a little pond at some point. And one was thinking about that and thinking, yeah, it must have been a long time ago anyway, because it can't be since 1918 when the park was started, uh, was formed, because, um, you know, you wouldn't, be want, you wouldn't want to be flooding these, um, these bridges here. And so we came across this little interpretive sign and they explained that actually uh, in the farms around here, this was known as the, the, dance, uh, the dance floor. In the 1800s, people would, would uh, gather here and um, they, they would hold dances and stuff. And uh, then, um, and, and also uh, the monks probably came down here. Um, and that was in the, uh, the bit about the monks was uh, when there used to be a pond, and I, I turned on the sign it said that indeed there used to be a pond here um, centuries ago. And the monks were in the nearby village of Dalby, and there was quite a large monastery up there, and they lived off the land here. So they speculate that it's quite possible that the monks kept carp down here and, uh, you know, cultivated them, and it was part of their. Uh, of their livelihood here. So uh, it's very interesting, uh, you know, reading the land as text, interpreting it, guessing what was here. And what is even more interesting is that they tell you about it and can correct your fantasies. This was also known as a place uh, of trolls and gnomes. And the, the, on the sign here, they tell a story about that, but I won't take your time reading that now. But uh, we'll see, maybe later. Yeah, well, it's t time for me to find Helene now. And I heard her voice coming from somewhere. And, oh, there she is. Yeah, she's rather camouflaged. Yeah, wow. Who knows where you'll, you're, you'll find your wife on a winter's afternoon in, in Europe's smallest national park. Hey, Helene. Hey. What are you doing? I'm taking a nap. Oh, uh, taking a nap. Yeah. Well, you you fit in very well here. Your yeah. your coat just fits beautifully. Mm -hmm. Is it nice, comfortable? Very, very comfortable. Oh, great! Yeah. It's just what you needed, right? Yeah. Okay. All Good right. Good for the back. Good for the back. Yeah. Well, anything that makes you want to come back here, I'm happy. <laughs> I'll say bye for now, and uh, maybe sometime we'll get to. Europe's largest national park, wherever that is. I'll have to figure that out. Uh, there's several candidates that I could have in mind, but I'm not going to risk uh, guessing right now. But we'll get to that another time. Could easily be in Sweden or Norway or northern Finland. We'll see. Bye for now.